So to begin this check-in process, we're gonna work from the feet up and see if the linkages between the feet up to your jaw and your neck are there for you or if they're a little off. Some of these are very subtle. Do your best to quietly tune in to these movements. So let's start with the feet pronating. To gauge how well our feet are pronating today, as we do this check-in, we're going to reference where you're feeling the pressure go in your feet. And as you know, review, the pressure should go more slightly forwards and onto the inside part of your feet if you're getting a pronation to take place. So what you're going to do now is just bend your knees. Don't think about it too much. And just feel, as you bend your knees, which way is the pressure going in your feet? More in, staying the same, or going to the outsides of your feet. And I don't want you to make this a thing. Don't make this into an exercise. You're just bending your knees like it's the first time you've ever bent your knees in your life. What happens to your feet as a natural response? Not what do you wish happened or what you've been trained to do, what actually happens? So if you just bend your knees and you're just letting it happen, what you should feel ideally is that the weight goes onto the inside of your feet and starts to travel forwards from the heels. That's what we want to happen. Knee bending and foot pronation, we want to see that happen together. That doesn't mean this, but it does mean not this. <laughs> okay? That's our first link in the chain. Now, if you do that again, if you bend your knees and feel the pronation of your feet, I'll show you from the side, we're gonna add in a pelvis anterior tilt. So what that means is you're tipping your pelvis forwards. And now I want you to feel, did adding in that pelvis anterior tilt allow you to bend your knees a bit deeper? and get more weight to the insides of your feet and more weight forwards? In theory, the answer should be yes. If you add in an anterior tilt, it should feel like you can deepen your knee bend slightly, more weight should go onto the inside of the feet and forward slightly as your feet pronate. We want to see knee bend, pelvis anterior tilt, and foot pronation all happen simultaneously when you walk. It only happens once per footstep, but we still want it to happen. We only get one chance at it. Now, if you didn't feel those things happening, let's check out how you're doing your anterior tilt because this is very important. Now, there's two ways to anterior tilt the pelvis. I may have said this in the workshop, depending on which uh, group that you are. There's two ways to anterior tilt the pelvis. One way is the right way, one way is the wrong way. So the wrong way, try this, lock your knees, and now stick your tailbone up and back, and let your butt go behind your head. That's an anterior tilt of the pelvis, but did you feel how your weight probably shifted back to your heels? So weight back in the heels, is not a good pronation situation. Now, the second way to do that anterior tilt is to take your pelvis, the bones at the front here, keep your butt on top of your knees, keep your knees stacked up on top of your feet, and just go down and forwards with your bones at the front of your pelvis. Spill the suit bowl forwards. And if you can do that, keeping your knees over your feet and your pelvis over your knees, letting your knees unlock, that anterior tilt should feel quite different than this one. So the second one, with the bones going down and forwards, staying stacked up, Head on ribcage, on pelvis, on knees, on feet, stacked up like a shish kebab. This should feel like a better quality foot pronation. It might be small, but it's definitely not the weight going back on the heels. 
and smushing the lower back here. So if you put this all together, bend your knees, trying to stay stacked up, do an anterior tilt with your pelvis, the one that goes forwards and down, not the one that goes back and up. You should feel that deepening pronation, deepening the knee bend, and you'll reach a natural stop where you can't go any further. Now, what happens if you posterior tilt your pelvis? What you should feel is how, is if you kept your knees bent, that by doing a posterior tilt, you weren't able to bend them as deeply, like you came up a little bit. You should also feel how doing that posterior tilt puts the weight on the outsides of your feet now. So instead of my knees going forwards, as I posterior tilt, my knees point out, my weight goes out, I feel blocked at the front of my ankles. I can't bend them any deeper. There's just no room. There's a bit of strain in my knees and I can't bend them. And so what we want to do instead is encourage the mechanics of the anterior tilt with the knee bend, with the foot pronation. For you dancers, this is so not what they taught us to do in the plie. In plies, we were taught to keep the pelvis neutral, not let the feet roll in and just bend the knees. And it's no wonder that the knees get so much abuse when we dance. They're just caught in the middle of this weird situation here. Okay, so we've got our three links in the chain, feet, knees, pelvis. So what happens with the rest of the spine? As you know, when you anterior tilt your pelvis, you should start to feel this arching response in the spine. So this extension where we have the rib cage now going, if we reference the front, the xiphoid here, this part's going up and back as the pelvis goes down and forwards, creating our cog, pelvis, rib cage, cog. What does the skull do? It should be doing the opposite, right? So the skull is tilting forwards if you reference your chin. This is just a review here of the cog motions. Now, let's see if we don't have this anterior tilt set up correctly, how that might impact up top. So we're just building this up. So what I want you to do is just reach both arms up like this and feel how that lifts your chest up. So if you lift your arms up, if you go to your full range, it should feel like it naturally just pulls your rib cage up and extends your spine. So find that spot. Don't force it, just find that spot where you reach your arms up all the way to your natural endpoint. It should feel like it starts to extend your spine, lifting the chest up. So how might that be affected if we're not doing a good anterior tilt, which means we're probably not doing a good pronation either. So I want you to now do the bad version of anterior tilt. Lock your knees, stick your back, your tailbone up and back, and now try to do that same arm lift. What you'll notice is you get blocked pretty fast and you aren't able to extend your back anymore. You aren't able to lift your chest up taller without compressing your spine here. So you're stuck by virtue of this pelvis anteriorly tilting, but not in the way we want to see it. Now, if you do that again, this time do the good anterior tilt. So keep your pelvis stacked up over your knees, knees over your feet, and without shifting your butt back, just do a little tilt forwards and down with the pelvis. And you should feel how just doing that and then reaching your arms up, you should have so much more range available to you through your chest to lift and through your arms versus this. And then if you deepen your knee bend and let your feet pronate, you should feel that that is quite free. So we have this whole action of spine extension happening with the feet pronating and the knees bending and the, the chest lifting up. Now, getting up into our area of interest, our neck and our skull and our jaw. So if we just take this rib cage lift, 
into the posterior tilt, extending the spine. We should see that the head, if you keep your eyes on the horizon, doesn't move, but by virtue of the rest of the spine moving underneath it, you get this closure between your chest and your chin and an opening at the back of the neck. So I just want you to gauge how well you feel like the back of your neck can open up. Does it feel like you can get some space here just by lifting your chest up? You might feel a gentle stretch back here as things are getting pulled apart at the back of your neck. Now, as you do this, let's add in some jaw. We talked about retraction and protraction. So don't do it in a way that adds more attention to your jaw. But I want you to now gently slide these pointy bits of your mandible forwards into your protraction. And now holding that protracted jaw, so like a decompressed jaw, try to lift your chest up and just see if that feels different to do. So jaw forwards, chest up, and you should feel how that puts a lot more movement into your neck. You should feel how your upper spine can bend a bit more. And you should feel how you get a lot more movement through the very base of your skull. You're able to do more of this tilting down of the head with the jaw protracted forwards. And if that's not happening for you, either you don't have a problem to solve, so it's not an issue, or something ain't right. <laughs> There's a bit of a miscommunication. Now let's try if the opposite is true. So you're going to now retract your jaw like this, shoving the pointy bits more back into your face. And if you hold that retracted jaw and then try to do the same extension up with your spine, so lifting the rib cage up, and just observe how that affects your neck. I just don't want to go. That's as far as I can go. And it feels like there's a lot of tension and compression. Well, compression it would be back here. I just, there's no space. When the jaw is shoved back this way, it doesn't allow for the skull to do this forward tilting. So just try that again if you'd like to feel it. Slide your jaw forwards and retract it. Chest up. Feel how that makes the movement easier. And then try the opposite, retract. Chest up. Oh, feel how blocky that feels. It's just not nice. And so what we can see is that there's this relationship that when the feet pronate, it has this ripple effect all the way up to the skull. And because the jaw is dangling from the skull, what we want to see to make a, a broad rule here is when the foot is pronating, or when both feet are pronating, the jaw should be decompressing. So isn't that another lovely thing just to embrace about pronating your feet? We need to pronate the feet in order for the jaw to decompress. 